Gross, uh, we come in and in a Fregans video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case, episode 66 of my game system design series of videos. In this video, I'll investigate creating building blocks playing areas, which could be used for Napoleonics, World War II, and Cold War figure gaming. If you wish to have a figure game, there are three methods used to create a playing area. These are historical playing areas, points-based or dice-rolling methods, or select a playing area from a standard set of playing areas. Obviously, we could just wing it and just throw terrain around like a bunch of girls throwing pillows around in the pyjama party, but let's put that option to one side for the purposes of this video. Historical playing areas are the easiest, although they take up a lot of upfront work. As you are dealing with a playing area which actually exists, you will not end up with an unusual or unrealistic playing area. The only downside with this approach is the scale of your rules and the historical battle you are reproducing need to be considered. If each element represents a Napoleonic regiment or a World War II battalion, then there is normally little to worry about. But if your element represents a Napoleonic company or a World War II platoon, it can be difficult getting sufficient detailed maps and a workable scenario to use in order to create such a playing area. The most common method um, is some type of system which allows both players to slowly build up the playing area, perhaps points for each player to expend on terrain pieces, and then those players place the terrain with some dicing to determine if the location moves. WRG, DBMM, is a best example of this, and it works very well for those rules. The issue is when you use a similar system for Napoleonics, much less World War II or Cold War, it can take an hour just to create the playing area. If players enjoy slowly building up a playing area, then knock yourself out. But for those who do not need another, do not wish to do this, then they need another system. This may also be why World War II, Cold War and Napoleonics have such a focus on historical scenarios rather than points-based games games, which is common for ancients. The final method is to create a set of standard building block playing areas, one of which is selected by some form of dice roll or agreement and with some minor terrain flexibility. I need to uh, make this fairly clear. I'm only dealing with Napoleonic, World War II or Cold War playing areas. Ancient battles tend to be fought on a playing area which both sides normally agree to fight on, which results in a playing area which does not resemble anything you would expect, let's say, in a Napoleonic battle. Apart from this, terrain tends to be less common and using a points-based dicing system works extremely well for ancients. Let's now get down to the meat of this video and drill down and... Let's see how we can create some standard building block playing areas that you can select from. When I initially looked at this whole concept many years ago, I always remembered the principles which DBM used for terrain. WRG used a basic principle which was an attack. The attacker will always choose the path to travel, normally a road or easy to traverse terrain. In turn, the defender will choose the location along the path to defend. In principle, this works for most periods, although during World War II, a prepared attack may not follow this principle, as often these attackers were, or attacks were designed to outflank the logical path, which was too heavily defended to attack frontally. We'll briefly look at this later in the video. The next principle I typically used was the flanks would normally contain a lot of terrain such as rough hills, woods, swamps, water features, etc. The central path would contain most of the human created terrain features such as tone, towns and roads and perhaps some gentle hills. Unfortunately, this latter assumption was wrong in most historical cases for Napoleonic's World War II and Cold War periods, but um, this was my original methodology that I followed. The biggest error I had with this simple methodology of the attacker selecting the path, the defender selecting the point where they would defend, and the flanks containing natural terrain features and human in the centre, was the location of water features. While in ancient's period a river would often close off a flank, in Napoleonic's World War II and Cold War periods, water features often went across the attacker's line of attack. It was uncommon to have a water feature close off a flank completely, although it could partially close off a flank, so it didn't tend to work for World War II and Napoleonic's. 
The next really big error was to do with the scale. I normally use a scale of 1 in 10,000 for Napoleonic's World War II or Cold War games, and at this scale there is often more than one path to travel for the attacker, as well as paths which ran off the playing area flank edges. In simple terms, the story was far more complex than I originally expected, and I suspect the biggest reason for this was scale mismatch. After this disappointing conclusion, quite a few years ago, um, I reverted to a dicing system to create terrain, which did actually work, I have to admit, but it took far too long. The result is I mainly focus these days, or at least I did, on historical battles, as I can easily pre-create the terrain. But this means uh, ad hoc points-based games become pretty much impossible. One possible solution would be to look at historical battlefields and determine if there was any common features which can be used to create what I call standard playing areas which may be applicable to a points-based game. Let's start with Hohlinden, 3rd December 1800. This was a battle fought between the French and Austrians, with the French being victorious. The battlefield was about 12 kilometres wide, if not more, as you can see on this map here, which shows the battlefield area. Historically, the Austrians approached in four columns, the, cent the strongest one being in the centre, the next strongest on the Austrian right flank. Two other smaller forces are shown as dotted lines. In this case, there are four roads entering the playing area from the Austrians' player's edge, and each has an Austrian column advancing along it. The French defensive position is shown on the right, with a French counterattack shown on the French, well, the French right flank, but on the left of this screen. The counterattack ran along a road. The French defensive position blocked off the other roads. The French defensive line was positioned in a manner which allowed them to counter-attack the Austrians as they moved out of the woods. This occurred in the centre, forcing the Austrians back. This did not work on the French left flank, which is why the Austrians managed to hold their line. The first point to note is the water features, which run across the line of the Austrian at attack, as well as closing off the left flank. The main thrust moves along a line free of water features, which tended to be a valley. While most roads run along the easiest path, they often cross water features. In conclusion, at least half the battlefields has rivers running across it. The second point is the attack fo followed the line of the major roads, and the defenders made the decision to defend across the roads or line of advance, which kind of aligns with my earlier principle, or the WRG principle. There are minor roll roads as well, which provided difficult to travel along due to the heavy rain, but they did represent the optimal line of advance of two of the Austrian advances and the French counterattack in particular. The other points are typically self-evidence. Built-up areas are placed on roads, trails and at rivers. The built-up areas avoided the bad terrain, but is otherwise evenly distributed. The bad terrain, in this case a combination of woods and steep hills, is very heavy in this particular battle. This is unusual, but the actual French line is about 6 kilometres wide with rough terrain on either flank up the top right corner and is otherwise in very good terrain. The other point is that there is no terrain closing off the flanks. In theory, the Austrians could move beyond the edge of the playing area, but there was a lack of major roads. Thus, the flanks were not technically closed off. Instead, they were an obstacle because no main road extended beyond the flank close enough to support the other advances. Thus, what really closes off the flank in this case is command control. The French counterattack was led by a brilliant commander, which, if less aggressive, would have failed in its attack, with the result the Austrians may well have not been defeated, at, well, at least as badly as they actually were. If we only look at water features and major roads, this is a stylized version of the playing area. In reality, if you're creating this playing area, it would not, create, it would not consist of straight lines, but would be more natural. However, the basic structure would be the baseline, or this is the basic structure, which would be the baseline for the playing area. Let's now look at Marengo. In this case, there is no main road, instead only a trail, and the Austrian attack flowed or followed it. One advantage of the trail was that it normally contained a bridge, which would be rather helpful in allowing wagons to cross streams and rivers. The French, while surprised, formed up in front of and then behind the water feature, which was a stream and crossable, but was useful in defence. 
There is a stream across the Austrian line of advance. There is a road running along the attacking line of advance. Built-up areas are on the road, but also elsewhere evenly distributed. Apart from some hills in the centre and on the left, there is very little terrain in this battle. Once again, the flanks were open, and when the Austrians had an advantage, they attempted to outflank the French. When the forces were more equal, the outflanking stopped. I suppose command control once again was a factor here. This is a stylized version of the playing area. While the road running from player edge to player edge may not be major, it was a main communication feature and thus included in this map. Let's now look at Austerlitz, which is an unusual battlefield in many ways, but still follows our general rules. The Allied armies were defending the approaches to Austerlitz, although in this case the French objective was to defeat the Allied army to form peace or to drive peace. The attacker line of attack is shown. The Allied line of defence is also shown here. The bulk of the Allied army was in a good defensive terrain position and Napoleon lacked the strength to attack this position. Thus he needed the at Allies to attack first. As it turned out, the Allies attacked the French right flank, allowing Napoleon's left flank to advance and defeat the Allied army. There were a number of water features between the two armies, as well as behind the Allied position. In this case, most of the water features crossed any potential liners at line of advance. The only main road is shown here, and while it was a factor in the battle, it did not affect the Allied attack against the French right flank, or even the French counterattack, which finally destroyed the Allied army. What we show here is a stylized version of that particular battle. Note, the reason why I'm creating stylized versions of the battlefields is I'm trying to look for common features. So I could then use to create a, let's say, standard stylized uh, playing area to, for me to create standard playing areas. Let's now look at Yina. The French line of attack follows the road for the most part and then swings to the left. The battle had very few water features, but it seemed the French were avoiding valleys on both sides of their main, main line of attack. And while there were hills, it was generally good going. This shows a stylized version of the playing area. Apart from the hills, not shown here, it was reasonably clear terrain, at least where the battle was being fought. There were certainly water features on the flanks. Now let's move up north to Austerdatz, which was a much more confusing playing area. In this case, the line of movement of all forces followed the roads very closely. When the French saw they were under attack, they chose a position which was difficult to outflank, with the water feature on the French left and broken terrain on the French right. They also chose to defend a water feature in part of their front line, or they were behind a water feature for part of their front line. Here we have a stylized version of the playing area. A quick point about these maps, I'm only including rivers and roads on these playing areas. If creating custom playing areas, the rivers and roads are the main issues. Players can certainly use removable rivers and roads, but I tend to embed these features in my playing area. Hills, built-up areas, woods are all modular terrain features which can be placed wherever a player wishes. My theory is once you have defined the water features and roads, the other terrain features become a lot simpler to deploy, and these could be placed using a simple chart and dice system or some basic guidelines. This, of course, depends on how many standard playing areas are required. If the number is too great, then this may not be viable, and you always need modular water features or modular water features and roads in this particular case. But as it turns out, um, I discovered this wasn't really required and not an issue. Isla was fought in winter and all the water features were frozen. However, the Russians still used the war frozen rivers as a line of defence, I suspect because of the river banks. The French are travelling along the road. The Allies receive reinforcements from the road on the top left while the French attempting to outflank the Russians on the Russian left flank also used a road if they could possibly get one. If we assume the river was not frozen, uh, or if it was frozen, it still did provide some defensive benefit. Again, the river banks most likely. Based on this, this is what our stylized playing area looks like. Another point about my stylized playing area, as you can see here, they are square. As play could be along a short or long axis, this can apply to both types of playing areas. Now we come to one of the more unusual battles, Friedland. 
The Russians were trying to destroy an isolated French corps, but Napoleon was able to reach it quickly enough to turn the tables on the Russians and inflict a serious defeat. The Russian line of advance followed the road, and the French counterattack also followed the roads. The main French defensive line was along the ridges and with woods providing flanking cover. The river was the main feature, with a large impassable river running across the Russian line of advance. And um, unfortunately for the Russian, running behind the main Russian army. This playing area has a lot of water features, with one major and strategic impassable river. I'm uncertain if any player would wish to repeat the Russian attack, so I suspect this playing area could be probably bypassed or would be very, you know, a rare choice by anyone. We come across another crossing a major river battlefield. I have to reverse my earlier opinion. This seems to be maybe more popular than I expected uh, in terms of potential battlefields. This is the third, and I expect the next battle may even be the same. So anyway, let's move on. We will now cover Aspen Esselin, which is the French crossing a impassable river and was almost defeated as a result. In this case, the line of advance is not along a road, for the French anyway, but instead across a bridge, which they happened to construct. On the other hand, the Austrian advance seems to follow the roads. But the terrain here was open and flat, so I expected some forces did move across cross-country. The defensive terrain were the two towns of Aspen and Essling, and the result was a near-French disaster in the use of an Austrian 300-gun battery, Grand Battery, which caused the French a lot of trouble. This is a stylized version of the playing area. I have to assume the bridge had a path on either side of it and it joined up to the main road network. As I predicted, another crossing of a major river. In this case, the French managed to get clear of the river and form up a front line. The Austrians also decided not to contest the river crossing. The French line of advance on day one was straight up the centre along a road. On the second day, the line of advance was on the French right, also along a road. The Austrian counterattack on day two was loosely along a road. The Austrian position was behind a water feature and on a hill, offering a good defensive position. This shows a stylized version of the playing area. This is another crossing of a major river playing area, but one where the attacker gets well clear of the major river. It's also the only time an attacker which moved across a major river actually won a battle. The next major battle we're covering is Borodino. The main French attack did not follow the road, although there was a road to the French advance up north. I assume following the road would require the French to cross the river. Thus, to avoid it, uh, their main attack was on the other side of the road. The Russian defended along streams and other defensive features, and they also created their own fortifications where there was a lack of natural fortifications. This is a stylized version of the playing area. This was one of the more open battlefields, but even here we still have a lot of water features running across the line of advance. Should be noted that the um, the main impassable river, um, while it was a big river, apparently it wasn't particularly full of water and was comparatively crossable, which is why the SPI board game has endless numbers of bridges across it. Dresden is our next battle, and in this case the French are on the defensive. The French was defending a rather large built-up area until their reinforcements arrived and pushed the Allies back. The Allies' attack path followed the road in the most part. We now move over to the stylized playing area. The water feature on the right was a canal, which acted as an impediment to movement, and as a result I've included it as a water feature. Leipzig was the largest battle in the Napoleonic War, in many ways the most interesting. The battle raged over three days, with the French attacking and defending on the first day. This is a rather simplified, or this is a rather simplified um, rendition, but the Allied attack on the north, or the top of the screen, followed a road, and one of the main defensive push positions the French used was the water feature. The French attack also followed the road, that's down the bottom, although this area was very flat and highly developed, so the ground offered few impediments to advance, apart from the villages or towns. The major rivers broke up the battlefield and concentrated the two opposing forces, with little opposition or opportunity to go around any flanks. 
On the second and third days, the Allies arrived in number and the French in the French rear, and the French were doomed. Only if you could defeat the main Allied army on day one would have the French been able to win, and of course they failed to do so. There are a lot of roads in this playing area, so I've only included the main ones, but um, you can see that the main water feature dominated the playing area. It should also be noted the scale. The scale of this battlefield was um, rather unusual. Um, it was a huge battlefield, and what I am showing now is my stylized map, but at a much higher uh, scale in order to fit the whole battlefield in. I've decided to include Quatre Bras because I feel this battlefield is rather interesting. This shows the French line advance, yet again another road. It shows the British position across the road and it shows why the French wanted to take Quatre Bras, the crossroad. The one thing this map does not include is the streams, which is a bit unfortunate. This particular map does show the streams. While they did not play a major part in the battle, apart from the British left flank area, the French needed to cross a water feature to get to the battlefield. This was uncontested, but if this was used as a standard playing area, it would be an option for the defender to defend across. When we move over to the stylized playing area, we discover this is a nice and simple playing area. Now we come to Ligny. Without me adding arrows, you can see the French line of attack follows the major roads, and the Prussians decided to put itself across the line of advance. We have our all too familiar water features running across the playing area. The Prussians also used hills in their defences, and while they're criticised for exposing them into artillery fire, the position did make it harder to attack the Prussians. After all, the Allied army at Austerlitz held a similar position on the heights. But of course, back in 1805, there were a lot, or there was, a lot less artillery. One thing which becomes very obvious, when you create scenarios ranging from 1800 to 1815, the amount of artillery skyrockets, as well as their use being more efficient. But anyway, that's outside of the scope of this playing area video. This is what that battlefield now looks like. If you're playing around with the scale, you could play Ligny and Quatre Bras on the same playing area, which uh, Bloody Big Napoleonic Battle does in one of its scenarios, and which um, I've done in a figure game version using a figure game version of an SPI a board game called Napoleonic at War. It does change your perspective of the twin battles when you combine both of them, and it's unlikely the French player would follow the plan Napoleon used in this case. Send a token force to Quatre Bras and throw everything against the Prussian is probably what a player would normally do. But anyway, that's my opinion. Now we come to the all too famous Battle of Waterloo, or La Bella Alliance is the name I'm more familiar with. Drilling down into the battle, you know, like this, makes it hard to see the French line of attack. So let's look at another battle to make it a bit more clear. This shows the same battlefield, but on its side and at a much larger scale. You can see the French line advance is along a road. There are water features here, but they tend to close off the flanks, and they're not a major factor. When the Prussians arrive from the top of the screen, the water features are more critical or become more of a factor. But as long as the Prussians follow the minor roads, there were bridges they could use, and as a result, the, the, and as a result they could hit the French right flank fairly easily. This is our stylized version of the playing area. I've used this playing area for a number of ad hoc games, and it actually works rather well, even for Cold War and World War II, surprisingly enough. Wavre is tends to be a forgotten battle, and as a result, I lack good maps, so I'll use the SPI board game map. The battle itself was not particularly exciting. The Prussians defended an impassable river, which forced the French to go down the river until they found a crossing, which they used, and then went back up to attack the Prussian corps in the flank. The Prussian corps left behind was defeated and forced to retreat. But this took so long that the other three Prussian corps managed to get to Waterloo and of course the rest is history. In the stylized playing area the major river dominates the playing area as you can see here. I've not included all the roads, only the ones which were important in the historical battle. This would be viable if the attackers overwhelmingly outnumbered the defenders, as they did with a powerful counterattack. I'm uncertain how reasonable this playing area would be as a standard playing area, but this type of conflict did occur with the smaller armies in 1814, so it may be a playing area that you would actually use. 
This summarises my analysis of major battles. I've not included the three major battles which occurred in Spain and southern France, and I've not included the more significant battles in 1814, as I feel the battles that I've actually covered are probably the ones most players would be most familiar with, and if I can't get a set of standard playing areas from those battles, I doubt adding additional battles would help and probably would end up just simply confusing things. We now have 16 battlefields to use as a data set. I've aligned all the battlefields with the flanks at the top and the bottom. Let's start with the battlefields which contain a large impassable river. Except for Alstadt, Borodino and Leipzig, the river ran across the attacker's line of advance. In the other battlefields it affected the flanks or closed off the part of the battlefield. Clearly crossing a major river has to be one of the standard playing areas, which does require some scenario tweaks to make viable. The attacker needs to be able to get across the river, either at start or due to weak opposition. Its main effect would be to channel the attacker and give the defenders a chance to hold them off until reinforcements arrive, as occurred in many of these battles. I am surprised, but the battlefields or the historical battlefields are proof that these did occur on a comparatively regular basis. We'll now look at battlefields which did not have a water feature crossing the entire battlefield. Dresden is only included because there is a small gap. As we can see, in all cases, the water feature did extend across the battlefield to some extent. It seems that even if there is a clear path, you need some water features around. I should note these maps are all at 1 in 10,000 scale. Obviously, at 1 in 5,000 scale on a standard playing area, you could have a water feature-free playing area, but they are not the battles I'm trying to reproduce. This shows the playing areas which have a stream running from flank to flank, which is not as common. I've even included Wavre, which I've already listed. Historically, in none of these battles was the stream significant, but it could have been. I'm uncertain why this is the case. Perhaps at the scale of 1 in 10,000, a stream does not extend as far as a typical battlefield width, which could range from 9 kilometres to 12 kilometres. Let's, let's quickly look at other terrains, such as built-up areas, hills, woods and swamps. You could simply use the historical battlefield, which makes the job of setting up terrain rather simple. If you wish some variability, you could dice up a number of standard-sized area terrain features and have the players deploy them with some basic rules or guidelines. Before they know it, they are attacking or before they actually know if they're the attacker or defender. You could divide the playing area into two halves and dice for each half to avoid unusual terrain placement. This should be comparatively quick, quick, although I'll be honest, every time I've attempted it, it's never been quick enough and tends to be rather boring. But nonetheless, someone else may get it working. I have experimented quite a bit with card-based force mixes. This is an example of French 1809 card deck. Each player selects a card until the trigger to stop occurs. They then allocate the cards into start forces, reinforcements at the quarter point, and reinforcements at the half point or whatever. Based on the start forces, one player is the defender and the other is the attacker. If such a sis in such a system, a player would not know if they're attacking or defending when they created the playing area. Thus, when deploying terrain, they would not be favouring defence over offence, or vice versa. The basic system would work for any set of rules, but does favour rules which allow you to command a number of core. Lower scale games need to start just before they engage with the enemy, otherwise you need a truly huge playing area and a lot of movement occurring with no combat, which typically players are not interested in. As for the actual playing area, I'm going to use 2 by 3 foot segments, which can be placed together, 1, 2, 3 or 4, to give you whatever playing area you so desire. My sweet spot is 3 by 4 feet, as I can remain seated for the entire game if I so desire. I will likely use 3mm MDF boards of the correct size. I could also use insulation boards, which are slightly larger, because that's the way they are in hardware shops, and much thicker. But based on my experimentation, MDF may be the superior solution, considering storage. My standard road network reason works reasonably well. This shows the road network when played along the long axis on the left and the short axis on the right. Both the designs could be reversed as well, so you could play along the short axis with the playing area on the left, for example. The three axes in the playing area are the objectives, which can be used for victory condition purposes only. Now I just need to create a standard water feature system, which ended up being the tricky bit, but I did actually succeed finally. 
Unfortunately, I'm not going to provide a final solution in this video as I've not worked it out myself, or at least I didn't when I created the first version of this video. But armed with the knowledge of what real battlefields look like, I'll construct a small number of boards which I can assemble in different ways containing roads and water features. If this fails, I'll simply use my historical playing areas. This shows my Leipzig playing area, which is probably not a good standard playing area to use, but nonetheless I really do like this particular battle. As a rather unusual example, which I've already mentioned, this playing area is a copy of the SPI board game Waterloo, in this case fielding World War II Russian and German forces. All these playing areas can just as easily be used for World War II or Cold War conflicts. The playing area is based on this particular uh, playing area is based on the SPI board game Versburg, but I have used my Napoleonic period playing areas for World War II or Cold War conflicts and they work rather well. I've even used this particular battlefield, which is a Cold War battlefield, in Napoleonic battles. It all works reasonably well. This concludes episode 66 of my video series on game design theory, in this case trying to identify a set of standard playing areas, specifically for Napoleonics and World War II Cold War. I may not have achieved my objective in this video, but I've got a lot more data to work with. One day I may actually succeed. Incidentally, this video I created quite a while ago, and based on the data I got from this particular video, I did finally come up with a set of minimal number of standard playing areas. So it did actually assist. But the lesson to be learned here is I needed to actually look at a fairly large number of actual historical battlefields in order to identify what an actual battlefield should really look like on average. And after quite a few years of research, I think I did achieve what I set out to achieve. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende.